Sears has a gift for making everyone happy. Like these suggestions from the men's store. The comfort shirt in knit, specially priced at just $7.99. Choose from a wide assortment of patterns and colors. Permapress slacks of 100% polyester double knit. Wrinkle resistant and easy to care for. Just $10.88 plain and $11.88 fancy. Sears has a gift for making everyone happy. This is KFMB TV. Rocky Graziano with Mike Douglas today at 3.30. This is homecoming day for Apollo 17, the last round trip to the moon that Americans may take in this century. In less than an hour, the astronauts will be back with perhaps what may be the most valuable cargo ever delivered in space. The spacecraft that lands in the Pacific will have traveled nearly one and a half million miles without getting so much as a flat tire. We're going to explain the voyage with the help of the slice of the heavens that we have set up in our studio with everything reduced in scale to its proper proportion. This globe represents the Earth. It's only one foot in diameter here, but really 8,000 miles across. After liftoff at Cape Kennedy, Apollo 17 orbited the Earth twice before it set a course for the moon. And while traveling at better than 24,000 miles an hour, the lunar module had to be taken out of its housing and linked up with the command ship. It took the astronauts more than 80 hours to cover the distance from Earth orbit to lunar orbit, and that is a distance of about a quarter of a million miles. And eight days ago, after 13 orbits of the moon, the LEM separated from the command ship and landed on the moon, where the two-man crew spent three days in scientific exploration. Meanwhile, the command ship continued to orbit the moon, which actually measures 2,000 miles in diameter. Our model here is only three inches across. In going around the moon, incidentally, the command ship piled up a great deal of mileage, about 538,000 miles. That's a part of the moon trip that we often forget about. Last Thursday, the LEM left the moon and rejoined the command ship in orbit overhead. And about four hours after that, the good old LEM was dropped back on the moon. It's work done. And then the crew, now together in the command ship, did not head for home immediately. They remained in lunar orbit for another two days. The only major assignment on the way home was to get some film cassettes from outside the spacecraft. That happened on Sunday afternoon. Since then, it's been clear sailing toward the recovery area in the South Pacific, southeast of American Samoa, where the aircraft carrier Ticonderoga is waiting. A round trip to the moon is about a half million miles, but Apollo 17 went three times that distance when you add all the trips around the Earth and the moon. And in our spacewalk here in this studio, we have gone precisely 60 feet. The Apollo really is a beginning. Apollo 17 is an end, but it's only a conclusion of the beginning of one of the greatest challenges that has ever faced man on Earth. presents the final flight of Apollo. Brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation as part of its continuing effort to bring you events of special importance. And welcome again to the final chapter in our coverage of the space flight of Apollo 17, the last one we'll be sending to the moon for a long while. The astronauts are fine, everything's running right on schedule, and at about 10 minutes past the next hour, we will be very close to what the spacemen call Earth interface, the 
the first touches of the Earth's atmosphere, and they will have a 13-minute fiery ride down into the South Pacific where they'll be picked up and we hope seen by television cameras. So we've got all of that coming up ahead of us this afternoon. And with me in Houston and to help cover this story, uh, Miles, approaching ever faster to Mother Earth, 22,566 feet per second at the current time. And that's minutes splashdown. All of them preparing to watch it, hopefully on monitors in mission control, the same picture that we think you may be able to see if all goes well on your sets at home. We'll be back with more coverage of Apollo 17 after this word from Gulf. of drilling. What do we got to show for it? Nothing but this miserable mud hole. There ain't no oil down here, Captain Lucas. Everybody's right about this thing. Yeah, but we don't listen to them. We just keep drilling. We must be crazy. Now listen to me. I don't care what everybody says. I know that there is oil down there. We can't give up now. Now start your engine and keep drilling. <laughs> Texas that day blew America into the 20th century. Oil became gasoline for cars. Power for electricity and heat. It meant the age of flight and the beginning of the Gulf Oil Corporation. But someday the supply of oil is going to run out. So at Gulf, we're working with another source of energy, nuclear energy. In Colorado, we built a nuclear power plant that will help provide electricity for thousands of homes cleanly and more efficiently than any other nuclear power plant in the country. At Gulf, we keep looking for new sources of energy because we need all the energy we can get. All right, the weather's fine. The astronauts are on their way, and at about 10 minutes past the next hour, around 2.10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, they should feel the first tendrils of the Earth's atmosphere 400,000 feet above the surface of the Earth. And we'll be covering all of that, of course, but in the meantime, the Apollo program proved that we could send men to the moon, bring them back safely, and solve the problems that come up along the way. The last flights proved that men could handle a variety of tasks on the moon. Before the launch of Apollo 17, NBC News correspondent Jim Hartz visited pad 39A, where these flights began. To most people, one Apollo flight to the moon looked pretty much like any other. In fact, there was a great deal of difference between the first three, Apollos 11, 12, and 14, and the last three, Apollos 15, 16, and 17. Apollo 13, of course, didn't make it. The first three were mainly engineering flights to prove hardware and to perfect landing techniques. The landing sites on the moon were in broad, level areas near the equator, which meant the chances of a safe landing and a return were greatly enhanced. Scientists did learn a great deal from the first flights, but it was clear from the beginning of the program they would have to go to the mountains on the moon before they ever pieced anything together that was profound. Apollo 15, launched in July of 1971, opened the scientific phase of moon exploration. Everything might have looked the same, but nearly everything was new and different. The astronauts were far better trained. Dave Scott and Jim Irwin had spent two years practicing field geology. The professor who trained them said he could have qualified them for a Ph.D. We have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. 
The Saturn rocket was aimed for a tiny valley nestled among mountains as tall as any on Earth. A canyon a mile wide bordered the valley. At least five different kinds of geological formations were clearly visible in high-resolution photographs of the site. The landing craft carried an extra 5,000 pounds. Part of the extra weight was the rover, which increased the territory the astronauts could cover by sevenfold. And for viewers on Earth, the scenery was spectacular. At last, the idea was taking hold that the moon was another planet, far different from the Earth, with a unique history of formation. In the absence of wind and water erosion, the face of the moon has changed little since it was formed. Almost any rock the astronauts stumble over has not been altered and quite likely has not been moved since long before the time of Christ, long before Moses, long before the appearance of man on Earth, before the record of any fossil in the deepest rock on Earth. Thus, in the top few feet of the lunar surface, there is a calendar that shows not only what was happening on the moon, but in the solar system and other parts of the universe as well. Not in days or years, but in billions of years, in ages, eras, and epochs that have yet to be named. Wow. Oh, see, it's twinning in there. Guess what we just found. Guess what we just found. I think we found what we came for. Triple rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. Yes, sir. Plants in there. Almost all plants. Do you like this? As a matter of fact, <laughs> oh, boy. I think we might have ourselves uh, something close to uh, an orthocyte. Because this crystal in there is just a bunch of just almost all plants. What a beaut. Beautiful. Scott and Irwin were jubilant when they lifted off the moon and they played some Marshall music. In April of this year, two more astronauts, John Young and Charles Duke, were back on the moon, again in a highland region, collecting more rocks. Nearly two years had passed since the first landing, and scientists were beginning to piece together a tentative picture of the moon's formation. At the beginning of its history, 4.6 billion years ago, scientists believed the moon formed from the gravitational attraction of small particles floating in space, perhaps in orbit around the Earth. In the years since, the entire surface has been churned up by meteorites, and that has left a layer of rock and dust several yards thick. The difficulty, obviously, lies in sorting it all out. Rocks that formed on the backside may now rest on the front side. Others, formed deep below the surface, are now obviously on top, and they don't wear labels. So the process of typing and dating each sample is laborious. Scientists and the space agency conservatively estimate it will take 10 years to do it. On top of all that is the data that will continue to flow homeward from the five instrument packages emplaced on each trip. There's one thing, it's a real pleasure, it's this gravity environment. Boy, Houston, the beauty of this place is just absolutely incredible. Someday, perhaps, it will all be settled. By understanding another heavenly body, man may gain great insight into the workings of his own planet. If that happens, if we can read the lessons of extraterrestrial exploration clearly, then life could become immeasurably better for us all. But right now, the results of the Apollo program are largely undefined, and it is ending. I'm uh, sad to see that the program's ending because I feel like it's a tragedy. Oh, it was exciting. Uh, I've always uh, wanted to work uh, at the Cape. Uh, anything to do with, uh, I have two older brothers that's always worked here, and uh, I sort of lived and was brought up with it. I hate to see the, the lunar missions come to an end, although I think we have a very progressive space program for the future. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started, all engines are started. We have ignition, 2, 1, 0, we have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It is now clear the tower. Apollo 
Apollo 17 was on its way, the last of the science moon missions. It was the first nighttime launch in the end of the Apollo series. It would carry the last three Apollo astronauts. It would fly farther, explore further, and come back with more material than any other Apollo mission. Those who created all this and were responsible for landing men on the moon call it the end of the beginning. They have taken part of what belonged on Earth, man with all of his desires and faults and peculiarities, and put him somewhere else, on the moon. Neither the moon nor the men who walked on it seem to have been damaged from the experience, but the experiment, this giant step, has not changed mankind. Wars are still being waged, the fouling of the environment gets worse, and man's deepest questions, where he came from, where he's going, remain unanswered. If this is the end of the beginning, then the questions remain. We can only hope that answers will be found wherever we go from here. But by that time, we'll have had more questions. This is Jim Hartz, NBC News. It's not quite over. These are live pictures from the beautiful, sunny South Pacific, taken from the deck of the aircraft carrier Ticonderoga, the prime recovery ship about 350 or 400 miles southeast of Samoa. And this is from a helicopter above, one of the uh, visual features they've added for Apollo splashdowns. You can see the big carrier down there. Those are possibly the only clouds in the area, very light high clouds, the sea is gentle, and the weather is fine. In many recent Apollo flights, we have been able to see them come down. Even the uh, Apollo 13, the unlucky one that blew up on the way to the moon, managed to get around the moon and come back and land within sight of the television cameras out there in the Pacific. So our chances today are reasonably good. We can't be totally certain because this is a tricky business. The men in the spacecraft and the spacecraft are now traveling at 24,609 miles an hour, a fantastic speed. When they hit the atmosphere of the Earth, it will be a, a little bit like hitting water at that speed, and what they've got to do is they've got to get their corridor done accurately. If this is the atmosphere and they come in on too shallow a path, they'll bounce off into space again, which would be a tragedy. If they come in too steeply, they burn up. So we still have um, the final, as Pete Conrad said, you take this one step at a time. But um, they have taken it one step at a time on a number of missions now. And there's no reason to believe that when they hit the Earth's atmosphere about 20 minutes from now, that everything won't be going well. Everything's going very nicely now, and we'll be back with more coverage after this word from Gulf. But, as we say so far, everything going just fine for Apollo 17. For a time, each astronaut who flies to the moon is in the public spotlight. But when that flight ends, the spotlight moves on to other people. Recently, NBC News correspondent Roy Neal visited some of those no longer in the public view. Prior to Apollo 17, ten men walked on the moon. This made them members of the most exclusive fraternity the world's ever known. They were viewed as supermen, with some justification. For as pilots and engineers, they were carefully screened and highly trained. The best America had to offer. They were not supermen, but they came close because of a dedication that drove them to nearly superhuman feats. Their experience in space changed some of them. Of the 10 astronauts who walked on the moon before Apollo 17, four have resigned from the space program to find fulfillment elsewhere. The first man to set foot on the moon, Neil Armstrong, now is a college professor. He teaches a course in aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Professor Armstrong won't talk to newsmen and refuses to pose for pictures. He's retired into the seclusion of campus life after an overdose of publicity. Armstrong never liked being interviewed or making speeches. After his trip to the moon, he was thrust into a continuous round of both as an international hero a figure in history, and a man who no longer could practice his profession, a test pilot whose wings were clipped because NASA didn't want a chance losing its hero. Now he's Neil Armstrong, a very private citizen. 
Maybe three. One of the men most affected by his moonwalk was Jim Irwin, who flew on Apollo 15. Today, Irwin tours the world preaching, telling people how he found God and came to Christ on the moon. Which walk will you choose? Would you choose that moon rock, or will you choose this rock, this rock of Jesus Christ, this living rock, this rock which will never leave you, that you can never lose? I ask you to make that decision tonight. You know, Jim, you've had the opportunity to go to the moon, which in its way made you a very exclusive American hero. Do you feel that perhaps walking away from that program is, is being a dropout in any way? No, I certainly don't view it that way, Roy. Really, it's a, it's a step up for me. The experiences that I went through on the moon uh, brought me to a new realization uh, of what, you know, what God is, to feel God's presence so closely on the moon. Uh, I realize that I have some fame, you know, as a result of being an astronaut who's had the opportunity to go to the moon. And I'd like to use that fame, uh, be it ever so short, for uh, a religious, for a Christian purpose, because I can't think of a higher calling than to share a religious message with people everywhere. I invite you to come forward, say, Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. Although for years my efforts have been devoted to exploration of outer space, my thoughts for tonight will be directed toward an equally important area, inner space. Ed Mitchell went to the moon with Alan Shepard on Apollo 14. He too has retired from space to take up what may be the most unusual new career of them all. Since I'm going to talk on consciousness and self-awareness, I would like you to just sample your own self-awareness for a moment. Get comfortable and put your awareness to the front of your head. Feel the front of your head. Know that that is the front of your head and that's where you are. What specifically are you trying to do? Specifically? I am very interested in what has been called psychical research. This is essentially the action of mind over matter, which physical science says cannot happen. I have seen it happen enough to know that's not so. What I'm doing today is based upon about 30 years of philosophic search for some meanings in science and about life that I hadn't found. Uh, and then when I went to the moon, things started happening that fit into place for me that compelled a new direction of effort. What things? I think it was a vision of the planet, uh, seeing it in a different perspective than I'd ever seen it before. I think the thing that impressed me most was that I seemed to have an understanding at that point, which I only was able to codify later, an understanding of what the Earth could be if we human beings allowed it to be. Uh, it looked peaceful. It looked uh, uh, almost utopian. It was blue and white floating in, in space. And then I had, had to realize that it wasn't like that at all. That it was really a very chaotic place that we human beings have uh, made for ourselves. And it was the difference between what it could be and what it is that was a real awareness for me. The second man to walk on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, has retired and lives today in Hidden Hills, California. He's writing a book, the story of a brilliant pilot and engineer who dedicated himself perhaps too much to his flight to the moon and then had trouble readjusting to the world. I uh, you know I had some problems with uh, depression after the flight and had to go look for some help. Uh, and I can't help but think that I'm a more 
satisfied, more settled person now because of having done that uh, than I would have been if I had just gritted my teeth and tried to put up with everything. I was kind of thinking, too, of, of, of when you look back at the earth and you realize you're walking on a different world, does that do anything to you inside? Does it give you a feeling for more of a feeling for religion, perhaps, or for where I am or what I am? Uh, not precisely at the time. Of course, uh, as I look on it, back during those precious uh, moments, uh, there's a little bit of a lack of reality. You certainly recall specific instances, uh, but it's so far removed from the nor other normal things that you're doing in day-to-day -day life. Uh, you don't doubt at all for a second that it all happened, but it is uh, a land that you can't just go back to again and re-experience these things. You have that, that one time to do it. Uh, and I'm sure that each and every person that's been there, especially those who have been rushed, as I think we were in a lot of our time, that uh, you just didn't have the time to sit down and reflect, nor did we feel we could afford the luxury of being able to do that. Uh, now I've heard some poets' interpretations of, you know, what they would say in looking out, and in a lot of cases, I think it's a lot of trash. I think we, in our engineering descriptions, uh, describe what we saw and the feelings that we had in a modern, contemporary, up-to-date fashion, and to expect uh, uh, something more from us, some poetic or uh, very philosophical things at that point, uh, I think was just not in keeping with the people who were associated with it. It's a far cry from walking on the moon to doing commercials on television. Does anybody ever say, Buzz, you're copping out? <laughs> there, the more you uh, get into the uh, public domain, the more you find that there are, there are a few people that just don't like what you're doing, no matter what you're doing. I felt in the military, uh, of course, in the years in Korea, things like that, that Oh, maybe 95% of the people in the country were behind what I was doing, you know, really supporting it. And in the space program, well, maybe 98%. There are always a few that aren't. But now as you start getting out and doing things on your own, you find that uh, there are more and more people that think you shouldn't be doing that for some reason. Uh, they seem to think that, uh, that maybe they, uh, in a sense, own us, and, you know, it's above us to go out and do things that uh, other people do, and I resent that uh, a bit. I, I put in my time and did what I felt uh, was an adequate service for my country, and I feel now the time has come that I'm not in that business anymore, that I certainly shouldn't be hampered from going out and doing whatever I darn well please. This is the carrier Ticonderoga. Reporting from CBS News Space Headquarters in New York, here is Walter Cronkite. The flight of Apollo 17 is coming to an end, and with it, man's exploration of the moon for the immediate future at any rate. Apollo 17, an absolutely perfect flight so far, except for that two-hour and 40-minute delay in getting off from Cape Kennedy uh, a week ago last Wednesday. But it has been perfect since then, and it's perfect right now in the re-entry phase, or the pre-re-entry phase. Just a moment ago, uh, the command module uh, separated from the service module, and now uh, Cernan and uh, Schmidt and uh, uh, Evans are on their way home in just their command module. Let's listen now from downrange to the Ticonderoga and David Snell. The excitement on the flight deck of the Ticonderoga is, of course, different than what is being felt by the frogmen right now. But it, too, is growing. Sailors and Marines already straining to get the first glimpse of the returning space travelers. Above deck, 12-year-old Kevin Steen, a guest of Admiral J.L. Butts, has the perfect vantage point. Kevin is the Arizona boy, dying of cancer, whose interest in Apollo is credited with giving him so strong a will to live he has so far overcome his deadly body chemistry. Kevin is ready for splashdown, and so are we all. David Snell on board the Ticonderoga. It's 17 minutes to splashdown now, and we've been listening to the terse comments from space the astronauts are making as they're checking out the last bit of equipment before they, they hit the top of the atmosphere. 
That will be at 75 miles up in about 16 and a half minutes. It takes them 13 minutes and 17 seconds, if all goes well, to travel that last 400,000 feet. The communications blackout will last for 3 minutes and 19 seconds. That drogue chute that we've all seen open so many times on Apollo will come out at 23,000 feet, about 7 minutes after they enter. And Apollo Control is telling us now about the aircraft that are going out, all part of the recovery forces. We've just seen some of those described from the Ticonderoga. So that all is well, all is on schedule, and we'll be back with more Apollo 17 coverage after this. NBC News will continue with its coverage of the final flight of Apollo in one minute. We pause now for a station identification. Stay informed with John. This year, Kinney Shoes puts Europe at your feet. Touring the fountains of Rome, Kinney Shoes saw this designer original and copied it. Now it's Kinney's own Piazza Romana. In London's Hyde Park, Kinney Shoes found an elegant design, gave it an American flair. Now Kinney calls it Mayfair Lady. Walk around the world of fashion, Kinney's got the shoes. The Brotherhood Crusade provides financial support for some 54 programs in the black community. They would like to do more. They need your help. Call them today. KNBC 4, Los Angeles. NBC News continues with its coverage of the final flight of Apollo, brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation as part of its continuing effort to bring you events of special importance. And that, again, the deck of the carrier Ticonderoga and the men of the carrier there um, with welcoming signs that we can read. That's a long distance away for satellite picture to be coming into your living room. And in about 40 seconds, over the equator, 1,100 miles to the northwest of this air aircraft carrier, 75 miles up in the sky, the spacecraft will touch the Earth's atmosphere and we will begin, at that point, the process called Earth Interface. Three and a half foot diameter turn. ring sail parachutes will be pulled out by pilot parachutes, small pilot parachutes, at an altitude of ten and a half thousand feet. The spacecraft will splash down at approximately 22 miles per hour with uh, three fully inflated parachutes. Meanwhile, the crew is uh, using the entry monitor system to steer for the desired aiming point, which is some 1,044 miles downrange from the actual entry point into the atmosphere. The entry, entry monitor system, or EMS as it's referred to, gives a display to the crew, which gives them the roll angle to steer to the desired track downrange to uh, hit the aiming point. Now the position of the recovery ship Ticonderoga may or may not be near the aiming point. Uh, the accuracy of the landing is dependent on the distance from the aiming point, not from where the ship is at the time. That's a squarely on the Navy again, Wally. <laughs> My typical complaint. Should yes. be coming out of <laughs> blackout as mentioned earlier at uh, Three minutes, 37 seconds into entry. This is the voice of Terry White, the voice of... Less than a minute away. away. And hopefully we will have confirmation from the crew on drogue deployment and main parachute deployment. Assuming that communications through the Apollo range instrumented aircraft called Araya it's good. Communications were switched to that aircraft a moment ago. As the spacecraft gets closer the to the course, it needs a relay Tyco, for that communication. The Ticonderoga Prime Recovery Ship has reported that they have radar contact with the spacecraft. Hmm. That's good. We should be getting that uh, out of blackout Probably here. Probably as gives track of the spacecraft with the ship's 
radar. Capsule communicator you'll be hearing from time to time is Robert Overmeyer. We've re-entered uh, blackout. This is Terry White talking uh, now. from blackout, I should say. We're waiting for a call from the space from the uh, Capcom. Terry White, uh, voice of mission control, is in Houston. He has his fingertips, all of the communication channels coming into Houston, of course, uh, being relayed from the range aircraft and from the Ticonderoga. We should be hearing uh, from the spacecraft itself very shortly now. That sounds like the crew. 3 G's got potential range. That's them. I can get 3 G's. Right on. Right 40. Okay, right 40. Right 45. And man's ninth trip to the moon. Okay. Successful on through blackout now. Should get that drogue to shoot deployment in another three and a half minutes. Right now. He's got 130 miles to go on the EMS, and he's pulling about three to 3.9 Gs right now. Thank you, uh, Sir Leo Prep, Chief Engineer for North American Rockwell that builds this spacecraft. The gas is off about three quarters of their velocity. That's still 5,000 miles an hour. Drogue deployment in two minutes, Mark. system is steering out the cross-range errors and so the spacecraft is rolling the velocity vector from one side of the ground track to the other and he mentioned, mentioned that he rolled over the top, the lift vector rolled over the top to keep the cross-range error out.
course, you get a terrible sinking sensation just before the mains cut come out. There it is. And there it is. Looks like they get three good shots. Okay. On Apollo 15, only two came out. They were just a little bit worried, but they all worked out well then. And all the is the large out of force very, very well right now. That space capsule weighs a little more than 14,000 pounds, and those three shoots slow it down to about 21 miles an hour. And we can see it from the ship. It's going to be so close that navigator George Bruce on the Ticonderoga was certainly correct. He says, we're not going to make any mistakes this time, I assure you. And it is very obvious that the Apollo 17 capsule is coming down right on target. That hasn't always been the case. There have been a lot of instances in the early Gemini flights when, for instance, Gemini 5 was 95 miles off target. But ever since Apollo 7, They've been coming very, very close indeed, within about 3.2 miles, and the greater accuracy, the NASA people say, is because of improved computer guidance systems that have evolved in this program. For Eugene Zinnin, this is re-entry number three. He's had three very good ones, too, on Gemini 9, the three-day... Exactly, very, very good ones. straight in. <laughs> Not going to get a wave off, you don't think? No, no I, I suspect there are yeah. more clearance. He hasn't called hook down yet, Wally. No, I noticed that. I think the car is afraid to get underneath. <laughs> I mentioned at this point that Ron Evans, uh, the spacecraft commander, is uh, going to be coming back to his old ship, the Ticonderoga. He was on the Ticonderoga, flying missions in Vietnam, the only one of the... Uh, moon flying astronauts he was a Vietnam veteran. He was flying those missions off the Ticonderoga when he got word that he was to enter the astronaut program. He went ahead and finished up his missions, uh, came home to enter the astronaut program. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? That is great. The shoes are very stable. Normally they've been moving around a little bit, but these look extremely stable. The feeling we're applied that. I think that's coming from helicopter. Yeah, that yeah. may be. It's not a study, is it? No, it's not a study, and it looks like we're above it. Yeah. One minute mark. Well, apparently we do have a Predicted helicopter camera. Yeah, that's good, but I didn't hear him call me Paul. You got a little Navy talk here while you're surrounded by him. Fifteen hundred feet. We've got about one minute left here of the parachute ride. A little less than that before splashdown now. We've got two Navy guys here. They can recruit Dr. Spit into the Navy. <laughs> well, I was one of the first correspondents according to the Navy in World War II. Then that <laughs> Walter, on that shot, you can see the 21-degree angle of dangle we have on the command module. That's so the toe goes into the water first to help cushion the shock. It doesn't hit flat. Oh, very good, Leo. Yeah, that's a good thing I didn't know. I didn't know you had a dangle angle. Look at that picture you see. There it is. Get rid of those shoes and stay stable one. <laughs> Look at Leo. <laughs> he did. Call for literature from right above. That's beautiful <laughs> shot. Oh, look at that. <laughs> We're even, Leo. <laughs> Great deal of cheering going on here yeah. in the control center uh, as the flashdown was watched in real time from the recovery helicopter. And mark the time at 3.04.31, ground elapsed time even. That's a perfect ending for a perfect flight. Uh, that true. has got to be certainly one of the most nominal flights, I think, of, of all of the missions of, of Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo. Just anything went wrong after the delayed departure. But even that was a safety measure when you think of it. Well, in defense of the vehicle, I think we ought to mention that that was a ground support equipment problem. Oh, that really sure. had nothing to do right. with the vehicle. All right. <laughs> we'll accept that.
No, it's a tribute to that whole checkout team that has nothing to look forward to and I think does such a beautiful job of preparing the boost to the spacecraft during his work. Very, very good point, Wally. I agree with that whole point. Now, sometimes these pictures break up from out there, you might point out. I think it's quite a feat. I've always felt so to get a picture from out in the Pacific. Mid Pacific, anyway, but uh, it's a very good time with the radar from the ship. That's what's. Oh, the to the I think you now hear occasionally the voice of the aircraft commander as well. Hey, man, that's a truck, man. It is. You know, that's a truck. You know, that's a truck. You know, uh, see the divers dropping into the water. John's a typical fighter pilot checking at six o'clock there for the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> you think of how many hours you spend practicing that stable two in case you can't upright it and having to swim out. Uh, it's a pretty happy occasion. <laughs> Uh, after 10 minutes, they should go ahead and uh, inflate those flotation bags anyhow, even if they do stay in stable one, just in case the vehicle tips over. We'll have to see if they do that. That'll allow the heat shield to cool a little bit so it won't punch the bags when they come out. Listen to these guys. <laughs> yeah, let's listen to them. They're, they're as enthusiastic now as they're worth when they belong. after the flotation gear is, uh, has been put around the spacecraft uh, by the divers. And CBS News coverage of the return home of Apollo 17 will continue in a moment. you hear of the astronauts are coming out of that tiny capsule out in the middle of the Pacific, 2,400 miles from Hawaii, and are being relayed into your home through the manned spacecraft network going to Houston and then on into the United States. That's why some of this equipment costs so much. Okay. 
stabilizes the spacecraft somewhat and also uh, in the case of you know, a big wave coming along or something like that splashing through the door to keep it from sinking one of the spacecraft in the early uh, Mercury series if you recall did sink Jordan, you're down there on the floor of mission control. Have they got the cigars out? But not just yet, Jim, but the latest word, sea anchors attached. Sea anchor has been attached to the spacecraft. Well, so is the public affairs. Ron Evans still on the voice-actuated circuit. Ron Evans has been sounding very happy indeed now that he's on that water. Sounds as happy as he did when he took his walk in space two days ago. <laughs> I'd make a note that a special effort is uh, being made to get the astronauts back here to their homes in Houston in time for Christmas. They'll be back Thursday. Thursday morning. Thursday morning. And uh, they have delayed the uh, scientific debriefings and discussions of the mission and things like that until after the holidays. So they'll be able to spend the holidays with their families. That was Cernan. Who Cernan served on the Ticonderoga as a fighter pilot about six years ago. So did Evans. Matter of fact, Evans had two tours of duty on that ship. As a matter of fact, Evans was on that ship, the Ticonderoga, but he was informed that he'd been selected as an astronaut. This is America, the command module of Apollo 17. Floating in an upright position, frogmen working around it, attaching the flotation collar, which will keep it floating, even if when the hatches are open, it should take water aboard. This happened once in our early stages of our space program with a Mercury flight, the second orbital Mercury flight, uh, second Mercury flight, that is, a ballistic flight downrange that Gus Grissom was the pilot of. Hasn't happened since because we developed this system to save the spacecraft in case it should become flooded. When that flotation collar is firmly attached, the hatches will be opened. The men will be uh, will come out of the hatch and into a raft, and then from the raft uh, to the sling, carrying them aboard the helicopter, and then on to the Ticonderoga. From the Ticonderoga, they will uh, stay aboard until tomorrow morning. Uh, rather tonight, later tonight, when they'll leave for Samoa, which is 400 miles north. They depart Samoa tomorrow uh, evening and then on to Houston and home for Thursday morning. Let's a look again at that spectacular splashdown of Apollo 17, which we all saw just a moment ago. <coughs> close-up camera. There it is as it approached the Pacific. Close-up camera. Three parachutes the open. Helicopter. At that dangle angle that Leo Krupp was telling us about, deliberate, to ease the entry into the water, 
You see the scene, a shot from a helicopter, and there it is right above it. We got the beautiful picture. That guy is They won't open that hatch door for about another four minutes, so we're going to pause now, and we'll be back with more Apollo 17 coverage after this word from Gulf. Remember when you were a kid? When you spent the whole day outdoors in the fresh air? when you were a boy, playing games with your friends in the fields, among the trees, out in the fresh air. Those things are still happening for boys. They're happening here. They're happening 150 yards from one of our largest petrochemical plants at Cedar Bayou, Texas, where we've preserved the land and the woods so you can still find campfires, cookouts, and fresh air. And there it is with the Ticonderoga in the background, Apollo 17, right on target. The astronauts are still inside. While we're waiting for the door to open, we've arranged to show you some slow motion videotape of this perfect landing. The, the pictures were striking this time, and better than we've ever seen. And if, when you watch it in slow motion, perhaps you'll see it even better than you did before. Hello, This is from a helicopter that man managed to get above the parachutes. Those parachutes are 80 feet across. <laughs> again in real time getting close now to the moment when they'll open that hatch
facilities. You can open up all that. First man out this today, gentlemen. Is it going to be Schmidt, the new module pilot? Well, if they stayed in their couches, it would be the center couch man. But I Texas think they're Congress milling around and trying to stand up because it's really difficult to room now, stay in their couches with long. management. Maybe flight tradition, the captain should leave the ship. Yeah. That's it. The <laughs> recovery operations on the Ida 4 television projector in the front of the control room. Uh, Walter, uh, Ron Evans may look slightly pregnant when he gets out of this vehicle because he's going to be wearing a counter-pressure suit, which is about like the NIG suit fighter pilots wear. Uh, this fits tight around his stomach and his legs, and it's blown up with air pressure to keep the blood from cooling. They're running this as an experiment to see whether it will help the, uh, the Skylab people or not. Right. Who's shaking hands uh, with some of the flight surgeons at the flight surgeon console? They also have aboard Ticonderoga the uh, uh, recovery vans for the Skylab uh, crews to test those out as well. Got a good look at them under operating conditions. This looks so casual here, it's unreal. This picture, I can't get over it. There's almost a glassy sea from the open ocean sailors at least. Like it's downtown on 7th, just west of the Harbor Freeway. KNXT Channel 2. Cameras, but there are sketch artists on board the um, Okinawa. Uh, drawing the, the scene. second astronaut in the helicopter was Jim Irwin. Because of an SH-3D Sea King, that helicopter, loaded with all kinds of electronic gear for locating the spacecraft. And the hatch on the helicopter is closed. It is off now toward the uh, carrier. The Russian trawler in the back. The Russian right. trawler is not far behind. <laughs> Where, among other things, a band awaits them. They'll have music. A little reception ceremony. Double one is the number of the helicopter in which they're riding. Okay, now it's down. And you can see they weren't very far from the carrier. At last report, it was about a half a mile from the spacecraft. Cigar is now being passed out in the control center.
It's a busy place out there with all those helicopters of camera helicopters, Russian trawlers, astronaut helicopters, backup astronaut helicopters, swimmer helicopters, and an aircraft carrier, a helicopter carrier, actually. One minute list. <laughs> <laughs> One aircraft carrier, five helicopters, four airplanes, an oiler, and a Russian trawler. Oh, no, Every helicopter comes in, two motorized whale boats have been dispatched from Okinawa to retrieve some of the parachutes and other gear that was possibly jettisoned from the command module as it came down. Recovery one up against some puffy white and gray clouds, making a picturesque we just saw a big puff of steam bellowing out of the stack of the ship. A welcome aboard from all of those in the engine room of Okinawa who can't be up on deck to say hello to the astronauts. Recovery One and astronauts Irwin, Scott, and Warden. The color, the color guard from the Marine Barracks in Pearl Harbor, silhouetted against the recovery helicopter as it comes down for a very soft landing aboard Okinawa.
welcoming the astronauts when the rotor blades are turned down will be Dr. Robert Gilroo, the director of the Man Space Center in Houston. Although Dr. Gilroo has been with the space program a number of years, this is the first recovery he's ever been out on. He also saw the blast off from the Cape, the first launch that he's ever seen. After these brief welcoming ceremonies, the astronauts will be taken down below decks where they will undergo five hours of intense medical examinations. After those examinations, they'll be eating their first earth food, steak and potatoes, and juice of their choice. Tomorrow morning early, they will head back to Hickam Air Force Base for a brief ceremony before their return on an eight-hour flight to Houston expecting to arrive in Houston about 9 o'clock local time tomorrow night. There are the traditional white stairs placed up against the helicopter. White stairs, a red carpet for them to walk out on, then a blue carpet, the three colors that they selected for this mission, red, white, and blue. There you can see Dr. Gilroo. With all our flights to space, he's more excited than anyone else aboard the ship. The Air Force Airmen, and here come the astronauts. American flags. And they've spent some long, rugged hours, too, all of these people. They were called upon a number of times to solve small but vexing problems with the flight, and each time they came up with an adequate procedure for doing so. So they were right to feel some pride in the accomplishment. <laughs> Congratulating each other. It's a good feeling. We'll be back in just a moment. Now here is a word from Go. You are going to ride the bench in the next two months. Three games. You're not. You're going to sit on the bench. You guys got some double play combination. You and another fish game back there. Five hours between the two. Oh, I don't want to hear you. Five hours being a golf dealer isn't exactly the easiest job in the world. Working long hours in all kinds of weather, cleaning windshields, checking under hoods, giving customers the kind of service that keeps them coming back for more. Is this the first intersection past the second traffic light after you turn off Route 41? So this year we're giving golf dealers a chance to make all that hard work pay off. Because the more they keep you coming back, the better their chances of winning one of 200 brand new LTD convertibles. Good service for you, a convertible for him. NBC News will continue with its coverage of Apollo 15 in a few moments. We pause now for station identification. Stay with NBC News for television's most complete Apollo 15 coverage. The lunar rover isn't very big or very fast. It hasn't got leather upholstery or 300 horses under the hood. But it's the most amazing land vehicle ever invented because the land it drives on is the moon. And when it goes there, Tang goes too. Orange flavored Tang, the instant breakfast drink with more vitamin C than orange juice. Good, nutritious Tang for spacemen and Earth families. What's the hand mean, George? Your Datsun wagon gives you a hand. Uh, it's got a long lifeline? All right, what? Ah, five doors. At that price? Drive a Datsun, then decide. For out of this world driving pleasure back here on Earth, see your Southern California Datsun dealer. 
for temporary relief of occasional mental fatigue from overwork, take Tyrant to feel alert. KNBC for Los Angeles. It was not catastrophic. Uh, we could take another look, perhaps, at that in slow motion in a moment. I'm going to get a look at that uh, splash. It was a beauty. Astronauts, as you know, those of you who have been tuned in all along, have come aboard the Okinawa, gone below now uh, for the medical uh, check. Uh, we don't have that slow motion right now to show you, unfortunately. I'm advised by uh, CBS Mission Control. But we may look at it again uh, in a moment. I noticed something there, Wally, that uh, uh, Lert and Scott must have been watching. Uh, Dave Scott's wife, uh, she must have noted, uh, uh, looked like he saved his mustache. I saw he shaved that, his yeah. beard, but I think uh, <laughs> Dave Scott's uh, got a mustache at least until he gets to Houston. <laughs> I know Ed Mitchell had quite a growth when he came back, and of course he's kept it, uh, the last yeah. I saw at least. Yeah. Something else to make note of, by the way, I'm not, I'm not sure whether John has his on, I may catch him, but this little device right here is the uh, pin that we wear uh, either prior to or after a flight, but prior to a flight it's a silver pin. After the flight, uh, after one is going above 50 miles, actually, 50 nautical miles, to make that quite clear, uh, an astronaut is qualified to wear a gold pin, and there's a great ceremony after the flight of the pin party, which is a very private party, of course, to the crew. What uh, happened to your pin, John? Huh? I was asking John what happened to his pin. Uh -huh, he doesn't have it on. I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> I had my briefcase. John just thought of it, so I looked out. <laughs> the, uh, where, when is the pin party held? Uh, I guess it's typically about a month or six weeks after the oh. mission is all put to bed. Oh. Not, uh, not immediately upon arrival in Houston, no. anything of that kind. Of. Uh, John Young, uh, any comments on this operation of Apollo 15 and today's landing? Uh, did, you're looking at it with a pretty critical eye since uh, you're going to be doing this next March. I thought it was uh, very well executed by the recovery team. They uh, really did a bang up job. It's uh, very difficult to do that operation and they practiced long and hard and they uh, really did a fine job. I thought the whole mission from start to finish was uh, somewhere between uh, outstanding and fantastic. <laughs> well, they were reading off all those first for Apollo 15. You know move to ask John what he will do for an encore. There doesn't seem to be much left. Well, I think uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I think it's a tough act to follow, and uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be doing it. Uh, if we can take uh, the information that they brought back, it uh, really staggers the mind. If we can just take uh, some of their data and improve on it a little, I will, we'll uh, done really uh, fantastic.